special session meeting tomorrow night at 5.30, Tuesday prayer group at 10 o'clock by Zoom, Wednesday, February the 24th, we are continuing our Lenten service, this will be our second one, and the Reverend Linda Muley from St. Mark's Lutheran Church will be here to speak. And uh, James, or not James, Jeannie and uh, Dick Ogden will be doing the duet, so we appreciate that. Bible study on Wednesday at 3.30, Zoom and in person. And next Sunday, February the 28th, after worship, we'll have our annual congregational meeting. Uh, if you haven't gotten your uh, annual reports in, I think you need to have them in by Monday in order to get them in the packet. Are there other announcements this morning? <laughs> Good morning. Um, this evening, we'll, we will begin our first uh, weekly activity through Lent with our family study. So there will be a code posted on Facebook this afternoon um, to join via Zoom. And if you still need your family back, please let me know. We'll get that to you this afternoon before we begin this, this evening. So again, the Zoom link will be posted this afternoon on our youth group Facebook page, and we will join together this evening. Thank you. And Tara and Jeff are going to be doing a bell intro at first this morning. It wasn't in the, in the bulletin, but uh, Wednesday they did this for the Lenten service, and it was so beautiful, and we just wanted to, to share it again, to lift up our hearts and worship. Good morning. Good morning. If you'll join me in the call to worship and opening prayer by reading the bold entries in your bulletin. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O God, in you I trust. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. 
for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you are the finest fire. You are the thunder in the mountain. You are the potter with the clay. You are the pillar of cloud in the wilderness and the burning bush in the desert. We do not take up our shoes as did Moses, but we do take up our pride as we stand in awe and reverence of your holy presence. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that we may worship you now in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please stand if you are able and join us in singing hymn 138 as printed in your bulletin, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Forgive us, Lord, for our preoccupation with things, for believing we would be happy if only we had more, for neglecting family in the pursuit of advancement, for giving low priority to the kingdom of God, for judging right and wrong on the basis of profit, for allowing discontent to cloud our lives, for pampering the body while starting the soul, with cries and petitions, we call out to you in the midst of our prison, in the agony 
agony of our pain, we wait for you. In the turmoil of our brokenness, we plead for your healing touch. Save us, God. Save us from death, illness, pain, depression, and economic oppression, racial inequity, fear, loneliness, violence, and hate. We accept your grace and providential care for us in every area of our life and cling to your assurance of love and acceptance. Forgive us, Lord, for our preoccupation with the things of the world and enable us to seek your kingdom with you and your righteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Assurance of Pardon Know that God always goes with us. Know that God is always there to lead us, guide us, forgive us, comfort us, and encourage us. Know that God is always near to us, now and forever. Friends, believe in the good news. In Jesus, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are transformed. Jesus was 
God in human form, but he still prayed to God for relief, for help, right? So in Lent, sometimes people give something up to show God that they're sacrificing something so they can fast and pray for him. Now, most of the time, it's food that people give up. Now, I have a friend who says, I'm giving up potato chips. And I, I think to myself, okay, she's giving up her potato chips. I said to her, what are you going to do? She said, I just give up potato chips. Well, you can't give something up without doing something for that, right? If you give up mashed potatoes, the pastor, Reverend Harris, won't care about that because he doesn't eat mashed potatoes. But we can give up something, but we have to pray and we have to fast so we can spend time with Jesus. Giving up something to eat, chocolate or potato chips, or I'm not going to drink my beer, or I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to do that, that's all well and good if you do it for a right reason. But just to say I'm giving something up isn't the reason, okay? What could you give up and spend some time in prayer for just 15 minutes a day even? What could you give up and think about Jesus instead? Amelia, you got something you'd give up? For 15 minutes a day? Your phone. She's hooked to that phone. Layla, what could you give up for 15 minutes a day and spend some time thinking about what Jesus does for you and praying to him? What is it? Your PlayStation. Kara, you got something you'd give up? She'd give up homework. That's not fair. <laughs>
We pray that you will help us especially focus on you during these 40 days of Lent so that we'll be ready to serve you better and do whatever work you have us to do. We pray that those 15 minutes each of these children are giving up for the day, they will find something in you that moves them to do their, your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, remember, 15 minutes a day, that's all you got to do. Jeannie, just so that you know I was paying attention, I was thinking of Dick Ogden the whole time. So that's 15 minutes less Yahtzee this week, Dick. Oh, it's right? Yahtzee? <laughs> Yahtzee. If you'll join me in our prayer for elimination, let us pray together. Loving God, you have so made us that we cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Give us a hunger for your word, and in that food, satisfy our daily need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. The word of the Lord. I was tempted this morning to ask you to raise your hand if you had read the gospel lesson that was printed in your bulletin and then say I wanted to talk to those of you who raised your hand because there's no 19th chapter in Mark. <laughs> Sorry about the misprint. It's Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. Listen for the word of God. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out, out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I invite you to join with me in the affirmation that's found in your bulletin. I am a child of God. I am in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I believe he has the power to change my life and your life. Former Beatle, Paul McCartney, coined the term anticipointment. He used it to refer to that feeling that fans have when an established group comes out with a new song and somehow it doesn't make the listeners feel young again. Anticipointment. <laughs> we had such high hopes but it didn't go as well as we hoped. 
Have you ever wondered if God experienced a disappointment with humans? God created people with such high hopes that we would always live in a loving relationship with him and with each other. God had a great master plan, but we human beings messed it up. God gave us free will and we used that free will to rebel against God. Now, of course, since God is all-knowing, God must have known this would happen, but it still had to hurt. In our Old Testament lesson, we come upon one of the most loved of all Bible stories, the story of Noah and the ark. Human beings had so rebelled against God that God sent a great flood to wipe them out the face of the earth. All of them except for a very tiny remnant. Noah and his immediate family are saved along with seven pairs of every clean animal and one pair of every unclean animal. You know, I find it interesting that when God decided to start over, he still loved his creation so much he couldn't just really start over. He saved the best of the best, Noah, the one righteous man in the whole world, Noah and his family, to start over, the best of the best. I also find it interesting that if we read on past our text for today, we discover that one of the first things that Noah, the righteous man, did when he got back on dry land was to get drunk and fall down naked fall into sin, embarrassing his family and everyone else. Hmm. Yet in spite of that, knowing that was going to happen, God chose to make a special covenant with Noah and with all his descendants, that is, with us. The covenant of the rainbow. God made a binding covenant upon himself that never again would he destroy all life on earth. And as a sign of that promise, he hung his bow in the clouds. You know, we, we read that and we, we hear rainbow. And that's, that's right as far as it goes. That beautiful arch of brilliant colors we see in the sky after rain. But it refers to God's war bow. God hung up his war bow. He says, I'm not going to make war on human beings. I'm hanging up the bow. When it rains, you'll see that in the sky and you'll remember. God made a special covenant with us. Now I want to talk just a little bit about that word covenant because Covenant is a churchy kind of word. Outside of the church, you don't hear it very often. In the church, we say we are a covenant people. God's covenant with us defines who we are. It's our identity. Well, the word covenant is related to the English words of will and testimony. You're familiar how people leave a last will and testimony so that their uh, family will know what they intend, what their wishes are. And so that word is related to covenant, which is why we call the scriptures before Jesus came the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, and the scriptures after he came the New Covenant or the New Testament. Covenant is a binding agreement between parties. Sometimes it's an agreement between equals, as in the covenant of marriage. And sometimes it's an agreement between unequals. Much of the covenants that God makes with us are unequals. In the covenant of the rainbow, it's all about God, really. God says no matter what you do, I 
will never again destroy all life on earth with the flood. It's about God, about God's intentions for us. And in Jesus Christ, the covenant that he made with us is again mostly about what God promises to do. God promises to save us. There's nothing in there about us having to earn that. Yes, we do need to accept it, but we don't earn it. We don't have to be worthy of it. It's something God promises for us. Now, wonderful. I think God's covenant with us is most like the covenant of adoption that parents make with small children. Often the children are so young that they don't even know what's going on. They don't earn the right to be adopted. They often don't even agree. Yet the parents promise from that time on this will be their child. They will be this child's parents. Whatever happens. Adoption is a legal activity, but it's more than that. Adoption is about the heart and the mind. Parents don't choose to adopt children in the best circumstances at least, just so that they can keep the legal letter of the law. They're promising to love these children as their own. I heard somewhere that the decision to have a child is a decision to have your heart walking around outside your body for the rest of your life. I think that's doubly true in adoption. The decision to adopt is a decision to have your heart walking around outside your body for the rest of your life. God's covenants with us are like that. God's chosen to have his heart walking around outside of him in us. Now, there are a couple of things I'd like to say about God's covenant relationship with us. And the first one, the first one sounds a little negative, but I, I want you to listen and give it consideration. In our covenant relationship with God, God is disappointed with the best of us. Mm. I say that to point out our need for humility. This is a big theme of Lent, you know? Humility. There are people who think that God is lucky to have them on his side. Have you ever met somebody like that? The reality is, God is disappointed in the best of us because none of us fully lives up to God's hopes and dreams for us. God always wants more for us. The word for sin means in part to fall short of the mark, as if an arrow is shot at a target and it doesn't quite get there. That's what happens with us. God has great dreams for us and we're continually falling short. So the first thing is that God is disappointed with the best of us. But hang on here, because God loves the worst of us. God loves the worst of us. How about that? As people, we're always tempted to label others, especially people who do not think like us, or look like us, or sound like us, or believe like us. And we're always tempted to label those people as less than us. We're tempted to puff ourselves up in self-righteousness. And it's if we don't say that God's lucky to have us on his side, we, we sometimes act like it. But we're reminded again and again that God loves all people. 
God, pe God loves those people that makes us angry. God loves the people we consider our enemies. God loves the people that irritate us to no end. As a matter of fact, we will never look on the face of somebody that God does not love. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to tolerate or accept bad behavior or evil deeds. It simply means we don't get to write other people off. We don't get to write other people off as being unworthy of God's love. We don't get to write other people off as being beyond God's help. Because God continues to love us, even when we disappoint Him, even when we let Him down. I was reading about a young soldier in Nazi Germany in 1941. This young soldier fought for his country. And then he was captured by the Allies in the Netherlands. And while he was in a prisoner of war camp, he was showing pictures of the horrors of the concentration camps, what was going on there. And he realized that he had been serving a great evil. One of the chaplains gave him a Bible, helped him come to a saving faith in Christ. And years later, 1947, after the war, this young man was invited back to a Christian conference in the Netherlands where he received the forgiveness and the love of the Dutch Christians. The forgiveness and love of the same people who had suffered so terribly under the Nazi occupation. And this young man was reborn by that experience. His name was Jürgen Moltmann. He became known as one of the greatest theologians of his generation. And one of the things that he was known as is for his theology of hope. I like this quote from Moltmann. But the ultimate reason for our hope is not found in what we want, wishful, and wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted, and wished for, and waited for. God is our last hope because we are God's first love. Let me read that again. The ultimate reason for our hope is not found in what we want, wish for, wait for. The ultimate reason is that we are wanted and waited for and wished for. God is our last hope because we are God's first love. Wow. Think about that for a moment. We are God's first love. You. You. Wherever you are whether you're here this morning or listening in, are God's first love. Yes, God is sometimes disappointed in you even when you think you're at your best. But God loves you even when you are at your worst. God refuses to give up on you. You are God's first love. God created us, breathed life into us, dreamed great dreams for us. God never gives up on those dreams for us. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to establish a new covenant with us, to die on the cross with the forgiveness of our sins, to be restored to glory as the first fruits of the dead that all who believe in him might know everlasting life. The dream God has for us is not a great dream to restrict us or to hold us down or to hold us back, but it's a dream of the abundant life that comes to those who live in a loving relationship with God and each other. We in the season of Lent here, we're in the season of Lent and we talk a lot about the need for repentance, for coming back to God. Let me share one more story with you. The story comes from Major Barbara Shear, who served as a military chaplain in Kuwait. And she wrote about a time close to Ash Wednesday, when there was a fire in the camp, and the tent that served as a chapel burned to the ground. Now the fortunate thing was, 
There wasn't anybody in the tent, so nobody was injured or killed. But the tent burned to the ground. And the ashes that she had for Ash Wednesday were in the tent. And so she decided that what she would do is she would gather some ashes from that burned tent to use for Ash Wednesday. And so she asked one of the soldiers at the scene to gather some, some ashes and he quickly scooped up a cup full of ashes and gave them to her. And later, as she was getting ready for the service, she noticed a glint of silver in the cup. And she dug around down in the ashes and there was a silver cross, tarnished, but perfectly preserved in the ashes. And she said, what are the chances of a random scoop of ashes scooping up this silver cross? And she saw that as a symbol of God searching for us through the destruction that has come upon our lives, that we often bring upon ourselves, searching us out, lifting us up, making us whole once again. Wherever we've lost ourselves, God continues to search us, to seek for us, to call to us, to encourage us to come home again. Because remember, you are God's first love. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. I invite you to stand if you are able and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our hymn is more about Jesus.
through this Lent season, I just want you to take a moment of your time right now. Think about the goodness of God and how he's been good to us. I have a brother-in-law who is in the hospital. He's in rehab. I have a grandson who had open heart surgery Thursday morning, 30 years of age. And I think about all of the things that we have seen and been through. So I thank God. Thank him every day for the blessings that he bestows upon me. And I think we all need to do that every day. Just think about the goodness of God. Oh yes, there's storms around us. There's a pandemic going on. There's other things going on. And, but God is still good to us. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we come this morning. We come to thank you for just being God all by yourself. We come to thank you for just giving us life and life more abundantly. We thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. We thank you for keeping us just another day, another week, another hour, another moment. We thank you for keeping those who we hold dear to our hearts close to you. And we thank you, Lord, for just walking with us, guiding us, keeping us from day to day, hour to hour, moment to moment. And as we go through this season, as we fast and as we pray. We ask you, Lord, to open up our hearts and minds that we may understand you and your word. Open up our hearts that we may love one another. Open up our minds that we may hear and understand one another. Just open up our hands that we may give to someone and that we may be able to help someone along the way. So Father, as we walk from day to day, moment to moment, as we go down this path, this journey of life, we just ask you to go with us, continue to guide us, continue to bless us, continue to be with us, Continue to be the source of light in our hearts. We ask you to continue to bless us. Now all these blessings we ask in thy son's name. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We continue our service of worship with the presentation of our offerings. For those who are here in the sanctuary, we ask you to place your offerings in the offering plates at the doors as you go out. For those who are joining us through the radio or the live stream, uh, we thank you all for your support of the church and uh, invite you to send it by mail into the church office 
the address here is First Presbyterian Church, 175 West Main Street, Clarksburg, West Virginia, 26301. Or if you'd like, you can uh, give online to our website. The website address is www.clarksburgfpc.org. And on the first page, there's a little green button that says online giving. With gladness and with joy, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. present before you the offerings of our life and labor, our money, our time, our talents, our influence, our very self, and ask that you would use them 
in your kingdom's work. For it is in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now our last hymn, Swing Low, Sweet Cherry. <laughs> swaying back and forth. Yes, I noticed some of you swaying back and forth. You're doing it right. Uh, I did want to mention, I forgot to mention the flowers this morning uh, given to the glory of God, presented in celebration of the birthday of Jeannie Harris by our husband, James. Happy birthday, Jeannie. Also, I'd like to thank Wayne for being our videographer this morning. We can't even say videography, but you did a great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Surely we have been in the presence of the Lord God Almighty this morning and received from his hand mercy and forgiveness, love, joy, peace, and power for living. Go forth to be the church of Jesus Christ wherever you may be. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon us now and always. Amen.